so thank you all for uh, coming back. Uh, my name is Stephen Hunt. I'm at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm your vice president of the Affiliate Angel Club for the year. And um, we're going to be uh, talking this evening about uh, renal ablation, renal cryo ablation with Dr. A.J. Gunn, the Director of Interventional Oncology down at University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to uh, Boston Scientific and our sponsors, uh, our corporate sponsors this year that have enabled us to run the software and uh, host these meetings and stuff without uh, having to um, uh, hit all of you up for, uh, for membership fees. Um, in particular, since we're not even providing you a hot meal. I feel like uh, this, is, this is true mission work. Um, but in any case, um, no, we're, we're very excited to, to get this educational programming, to continue this educational programming. Hopefully some of you caught the uh, lung ablation webinar last month. Um, next month we have uh, moving away from oncology. We'll be talking about uh, wavelength and the new percutaneous uh, arteriovenous fistula. Um, and, uh, and then we're moving on to just a lot of uh, programming that you guys all voted on. So we're, we have some fun stuff for the year. Um, and uh, keep an eye out on our Twitter profile and additional social media to you know, look at what the, that programming will be. But we're gonna be talking about genicular artery embolization, bariatric embolization, so a lot of fun topics and look forward to seeing you there. Um, so what's gonna happen is um, Dr. Gunn is gonna provide us a presentation and, uh, and some great cases and stuff like that. And then you guys just all, if you have any questions throughout, just type them into the uh, chat box and um, we will uh, at the end uh, be asking the questions and, and hopefully give you some time with AJ to, uh, to learn some of his uh, uh, tricks and, and pearls and things like that. Um, the other thing to keep in mind for, uh, particularly for our trainees is we're gonna have that uh, big um, kind of case competition at the end in June and there's gonna be some really amazing prizes, all right? Because we have not, you know, it's something we can spend our money on is, is you guys. So, uh, so yeah, so get your, keep your good cases throughout the year um, and think about that in particular as you, um, as we work through a lot of these lectures uh, um, and you attend them. Um, so ones that are relevant to those, uh, there'll be special categories for relevance to, um, to the existing presentation. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Uh, AJ Gunn, if, if you uh, share your screen and, and uh, take it away. Okay, uh, can everybody hear me and see my screen? And get a thumbs up from anybody? Perfect. Um, so uh, thanks for that introduction. And uh, my name is AJ Gunn. I'm an interventional radiologist at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And gonna talk to you guys for the next you know, few minutes about uh, image guided interventions for renal cell cancer. So, so we go forward, there's my disclosures. It looks like we're off. So I've just got three kind of big broad sections that we're going to talk about as we go through. And thanks for, for those of you that voted on my informal Twitter poll on Sunday about what you wanted to hear. I was a little bit torn. I'm glad that you guys decided to hear about practice building because it was what I wanted to talk about, but I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, the right thing to do. So I'm going to talk about some, some tips for practice building, um, and I, which I think apply both to academics and private practice. Uh, the next section is we're going to go through some uh, image guided ablation for renal, uh, renal cell cancer in a case based format and then we're going to follow up and discuss uh, image guided embolization for renal cell cancer and kind of talk about how I use that in my practice. So I want to talk about practice building just a little bit um, and hopefully give you guys, uh, everybody on, on, on the webinar some practical advice that's not just go to tumor board or right or not just give people your cell phone number because I think you know those things are, are true and they're real but I think at the same time. Um, that uh, I just wanted to give you guys some tips that have worked for me and hopefully they'll be applicable to, to your practices and your future practices you go through. So first thing is, is I show this case because this is one of the first cases that somebody sent me uh, when I was here at UAB. And what the phone call I got was, you know, it was a text message that kind of said, hey, can I talk to you about something? And I said, sure. And he calls and he said, first thing is like, don't say no, right? That's the first thing he said. And I was like, oh, what am I getting myself into, right? And so he tells me about, you know, this 78 year old guy who's got multiple medical comorbidities. You can see he's got this, you know, six, about six and a half centimeter right renal mass. And, 
you know, at the end of the day, like this is not necessarily uh, uh, falls into the wheelhouse of what we do with percutaneous ablation, right? Although we'll talk about treating larger lesions later. But if we say no to this case in interventional radiology, right? Like what's this guy gonna do? He's either gonna go off to SBRT, uh, which is RCC is not a particularly radiosensitive tumor, or he's going to go off to systemic chemotherapy or whatever it is, right? He's not going to get a curative therapy, right? Like, like ablation or surgery is going to be. And so when we bring the guy in, you can see, you know, we put like seven or eight probes in, you can see the ice ball there that we did during the treatment. He stayed in the hospital for two nights and then he went home and he did great. And you see the guy in follow-up and he's so happy, right? Because he went from having cancer to not having cancer. And this is one of the things that it taught me is that we just need to say yes. You say yes early and often. And then when you say yes to things, then you kind of, and we'll talk about this as we go forward, is you say yes to things, you get a reputation as someone who looks for solutions instead of looking for problems. And everybody knows in our practices that there's a way to approach things where sometimes it's kind of like people might put up roadblocks and like, I don't want to do this because of the INR. I don't want to do this because they ate today. I don't want to do this because of whatever. Or you can approach problems from how can I work around these problems to find a solution for this patient? I think when you approach things from that latter point of view, you're going to find a lot more willing partners who are going to send you cases. So that's the first thing. Say yes early and often. All right. And I think it should go without saying that we should be doing a good job, but you know, I think it needs actually needs to be said, right? Is because I, I, I cringe a little bit when I hear interventional radiologists talk about, oh, you know, cardiology shouldn't be doing this because they use this wire and this catheter and this is how they do it. Or they look at the techniques that vascular surgery uses for something to say, oh, they're not technically very good. And I honestly think from the patient perspective and from the referring physician perspective, I don't think they care about that kind of stuff. And I think if you're relying on getting cases because you use a uh, Amplatz wire versus a glide wire to do something, I, I think you're going to fail, right? And so doing a good job is not just about being technically good. I think that is the bare minimum of what people expect. When they send you to something, your patients and your referring doctors expect you to do a good job. When I'm talking about doing a good job is I'm talking about the communication that you have with the referring physician and the patient and their family. And that happens before the procedure, it happens during the procedure, and especially happens after the procedure, right? And so in my experience, people don't, you I mean, you can hit people over the head all you want with data, data, data. Hey, look at this, look at this. If they don't trust you, if they don't think that their patient is going to have a good experience when they see you, that they don't come back and say, Dr. Gunn was a nice person and I liked his staff and things went smoothly. That stuff really matters, especially in these things. You know, there's some stuff that's clearly IR, right? But there's some things on the margins that you might not necessarily get referred if you're not thinking about the total patient experience when you're dealing with people. So that's the second tip. Third, I would say, you know, all politics are local, right? And so what I mean by this and what is that I think, especially for early career physicians and residents and fellows that are going to go out into practice, one of the most important things you could do is go out and surveil your, your new practice and see where the gaps are. And that's why I have uterine fibroid embolization and an IVC filter retrieval on the slide is because I didn't leave fellowship being... I want to be a fibroid person or I want to be an IVC filter retrieval person. But when I got here, you know, Birmingham's a, a metro area of about 1.2 million people, right? And we were doing about 20 uterine fibroid embolizations a year, not nearly enough, right? And so that was an area where I felt like I could help grow the practice. And it was at least an area I had some interest. It was the same thing with IVC filters. The year before I got here, they had done six IVC filter retrievals in the entire year, right? We just weren't following them up. We weren't doing, you know, looking out to get referrals for complex retrievals. They were just either staying in place or they were going to other centers. And so again, this wasn't like I came out and said, I've done a million complex retrievals and this isn't a space that, that I need to be in. It was that I evaluated the landscape and kind of said, okay, here's some areas where at least some of my interests might line up with where the holes in the practice are. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, people need to go out and do things that they're not interested in, right? You, I'm, what I'm saying is you need to find a space where you're potentially interested, I would say, and, and see if you can expend some of your efforts there because your partners and your hospital system is actually going to like you better if you grow the pie for everybody rather than coming into a practice and trying to eat out of the same pie that everybody else is eating out of, right? So you just kind of have to surveil the, the landscape and then deal with the politics that are there and try to build your practice and fill some of those gaps that are in the practice. All right, so you know the fourth thing there is be patient, right? And so the reason I have this, this is a video that UAB Marketing put together when we were working on our uterine fibroid practice. And when I got here, 
you know, I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna work on, I'm gonna work on, you know, increasing our uterine fibroid embolization. So I did all the things that people told me to do, right? Like I showed up to multidisciplinary conferences and I tried to, you know, say hello to all the GYNs when we had shared cases and all, and I would email and say, hey, can I give grand rounds? Can I do this? Can I do that? And that's why I think some of these practice building things that people talk about are kind of cliche because like I was doing all of that, right? But it wasn't moving the needle. Then it didn't move the needle for a long time. And it wasn't until that we, you know, I was working to set up our ambulatory clinic that the marketing division said, do you have a patient that could go on camera and talk about something that interventional radiology did? And this patient was really well spoken. She had a great experience with uterine fibroid embolization, and she did this two, three minute spot, which got picked up by some local networks. And so literally within 24 hours of this going on the news, I got an email from the chair of the OBGYN department saying, hey, we saw your thing on the news. And we thought this was really interesting. And then from there, I came and gave grand rounds. I started talking to the residents because they had the resident run clinic. We set up a, a fibroid meeting that we, we talked with the residents and the GYNs about every six weeks about some shared patients. And so, you know, then things started to really move. So, you know, if things don't happen right away, don't get so frustrated that you quit. It's to continue doing something else until you find what works at your institution, which could be any number of things. But you can't be too patient, right? Like if you sit around and, and, and what I hear a lot, what I heard a lot was I've done this, we've done that, you know, uh, this doesn't work or all these other kinds of things. And what I would say, especially, you know, residents, fellows, early career physicians that are listening, you have good ideas, right? Like just because somebody did something sometime and it didn't work for them doesn't mean that it's not going to work for you. And just because one thing didn't work didn't mean that idea that you have isn't going to work, right? And the reason that I have, you know, uh, some, some background from, from my Twitter account up there is because that's been you know, that's been a huge deal for me, right? It's been one of the things that I would say, if I had to say, put a finger on what's been the thing that has advanced my career so far, it's, it's, it's been being active on social media because through that, right, I started posting interesting cases really just to show that UAB was a fun place to work and a fun place to train because I didn't feel like a lot of people knew anything about it. And then through that, you know, BTG reached out and said, hey, can you do some educational stuff for our reps, right? And then you go and you do that and you do a good job. And then they said, well, can you start doing some physician education? I said, so you go do that. And then once other physicians start seeing you do stuff, all of a sudden you become a de facto expert in this thing, right? And so then all of a sudden now I'm speaking at the SIR and the SIO meeting, the RSNA meeting about these kinds of things. And so you don't have to wait necessarily for, you know, some grand invitation to do things like you have good ideas. So don't, you know, be patient, but don't be too patient when you're trying to build your practice. All right. And then, you know, the next thing here is you got to do the little things right. And so this is, I like this quote, uh, it's from William McRaven. He was, uh, he was a uh, colonel maybe in the Navy, but this was from a, a commencement address that he gave at the University of Texas, where he was a chancellor. And he said, if you can't do the little things right, you'll never do the big things right. Okay. What do I mean by this? What I mean is that your referring services need to see you as a willing clinical partner, okay? I hear this a lot where, why don't we get more ablation? Why don't we get more taste? Why don't we get more Y90? All these other kinds of things. Well, I'll tell you some, and I'm not saying this is the only reason, but if you're giving the referring services pushback about doing a nephrostomy tube, right? If you're giving them pushback about doing a biopsy, if you're giving them a pushback about doing a uh, nephrostomy tube exchange or a biliary tube exchange or an abscess drainage or whatever it is that they ask you to do, right? And so you send it back to them and they have to jump through 20,000 hoops just to get a simple thing done. What do you think they're thinking about when there's bigger things that they could potentially ask you to do, right? Like they don't want to send it to you because they don't want to, they don't want to have to deal with all the hassles that they are potentially used to dealing with when it comes to with interventional radiology, right? So when you are easy to work with and it's like, hey, I can do that biliary tube change, or I can do this nephrostomy tube change, or we can do this nephrostomy today. Like when you do those little things, then all of a sudden it becomes, hey, you know, he or she is a reasonable person. They're going to treat our patients right. They try to get things done. And then, then that opens the door to sending, sending uh, bigger things along the line. So it's, it's one of the things. It's like if you're not seen as a willing clinical partner for these little things, they're never going to send you the bigger cases. All right. Number seven, you can't communicate too much. And uh, I just really think that this is super important, right? Because I feel like and the reason I do this is for a couple fold. One is I want referring doctors to know what we're doing with their patients. I want them to know that we have a clinic. I want them to know that we're ordering the labs and that we're ordering the imaging. We're arranging all of these other kinds of things. 
because I want them to see us as a true clinical partner, right? Not that they're going to order a renal ablation and I'm going to ask them to get the follow-up imaging and I'm going to ask them to order the labs and do set it up with, with anesthesia and do all these other kinds of things. So anytime I get an email or via our EMR, I might get a note and say, hey, can you look at Mr. Johnson's imaging? And even if I can't look at it right now, I'm instantly replying back, sure, let me take a look at it. And then when I take a look at it, I say, hey, looked at this image, I'm going to get him set up on our clinic. And then when I see him in clinic, hey, I saw Mr. Johnson today in clinic, let you, just to let you know, he's, gonna, he's on the schedule for two weeks for an ablation. Awesome. I see them for the ablation. Text them and let them know everything went well. We're going to arrange for the follow-up. And I do that so that, you know, that they know what's happening with their patient. And number two, I am convinced that when something goes wrong, they will find you, right? Like, like they will come and let you know, hey, this patient got admitted with pain three days after the procedure. And so what I don't want is for that one interaction in their mind to be, oh, listen, anytime I send them off to a renal ablation, there's a problem, right? Because that's the only thing they think about. They don't think about the hundred other times they sent me a case that nothing went wrong. And so in a way, some of the, some of the logic behind sending these texts and emails is so that they accumulate experience of, wait a minute, like 99 times I sent AJ a case and everything went great, right? And now there's this one time that there was a bleed or there's this one time that, you know, something happened afterwards and this is a one-off and it doesn't represent what happens typically in his practice. So I think that it's really important that we communicate with our referring physicians. Okay. And, you know, so I asked one of our urology oncologists, I was like, you know, if I had to talk to people about practice building, like, what's the one thing that you would say? And that's what he said, be humble, right? And, and, and his reasoning was that sometimes in multidisciplinary conferences and tumor boards, IR can potentially come off as like, IR is the best thing for everything. And we all love IR. We all think it's the, you know, we all think that we have a, a critical role to play for our patients. But the reality is, is that sometimes IR isn't the answer. And I actually think that you are going to come off a lot better in tumor boards and multidisciplinary conferences if you recognize that up front, right? That sometimes surgery is a better option for people, or sometimes chemotherapy is a better option for people. And that's the reason that I have this picture. This is a pancreatic biliary disease center that we set up at UAB over the last couple of years. And we had to sit down in different little working groups and decide, how are we going to treat this? How are we going to do that? And when you sit down and read each other's literature, you have to sit back and be like, you know, that's a good idea. And we should be doing that. And I think, like I said, you get more credibility in these groups if you recognize that there's a role for IR to play, but that you also recognize that there's a role for endoscopy or urologic oncology, chemotherapy and radiation therapy and a lot of disease processes as well. Okay, uh, do unto others, right? This is the big golden rule. And why do I have a big pot of gold there? Because what I talk about with my residents and fellows and my partners is I talk about the pot of goodwill, right? And what you need to be in your practice is someone who puts coins into the pot of goodwill. And how do you put coins into the pot of goodwill? You do that by being easy to switch if somebody needs to switch for call or somebody need, or sticking around to help finish up the last case or someone needs to take off to you know go to their kids swim meet or something like that and you cover a couple extra rooms to make sure that they can go and do that every time you do things like that you drop coins into the bucket of goodwill right it's the same thing that happens with our referring services when they call and say hey, could you exchange this nephrostomy tube today? And it's 3.30 already, and it's going to take a minute for the patient to get down there. When you do those little things, as long as they're reasonable, you're dropping coins into that bucket of goodwill, right? And so they start to perceive that you're a reasonable person. You want to help them out. And what that then what happens then is when they call you at 3.30 in the morning and say, we did a nephrostomy tube exchange at 3.30 in the morning, you know, then when you say, hey, man, like, couldn't we do this at 730 or eight o'clock tomorrow morning, then you're, you're pulling out some coins out of the bucket of goodwill, but you've put so many in that everybody realizes that, hey, if you say no, it's because there's a clinical reason for you saying no, right? It's not because you don't, you're lazy and you don't want to do the cases. It's because you really don't think it's good for the patient or it's just not the right time. And so think about that in your actions with your referring services, your partners, your co-residents, your co-fellows, you know, if you don't want them to do that thing to you, don't do that thing to them. Essentially, it's pretty easy when it comes down to it. All right, and the last thing is make connections. And the reason I pull up this text is because some of you guys might know Mike Barraza, who is probably one of your residents or fellows at Penn. And, you know, so Dr. Payton was one of the U new urologic oncologists here at UAB. And for like the longest time, like he wasn't really sending me a lot of cases, you know, for, for whatever reason, right? And, you know, it just kind of came through, I think Mike texted me and said, hey, do you know Chaz? He started there. I said, yeah, I mean, I've interacted with him a little bit, but like, honestly, I don't, 
get a lot of cases from him for whatever reason. And, you know, Mike went out of his way to text Chas and say, Hey, you know, I know AJ, he's a good guy. And this is the text that I got almost immediately from, from Chas Payton was that like, this is a small world and you make those connections. And this is what I'm saying is that, you know, every interaction you have is an opportunity to make a connection with somebody. And ever since this text message that we got, we have a really excellent working relationship because he trusts me and he knows that I'm a good guy, right? And so again, it's not necessarily about pounding people over the head with, with data. It's about letting them know that when they send patients to you, that their patients are gonna be well taken care of and that their patients are gonna get good care, okay? So those are, you know, in summary, right? Those are my 10 tips, right? So you say yes early and often, when you get it, when you get a referral, do a good job. And that's just not technically good, do a good job. Make sure you're talking to the patient, make sure you're including their family in those conversations. I think those things are really important. When you go to a new practice, remember all politics are local. There's a reason why things are the way they are. So take a minute to surveil the landscape, see where you can plug holes and, and grow the practice. You wanna be patient when you get there, but not too patient so that you pass up opportunities. Um, do those little things right along the way. There's no communicating too much with anybody. Be humble when you're interacting uh, with others in multidisciplinary conferences and tumor boards. Remember the golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And then finally, just take every opportunity to make connections with people. So that I think is a good segue into our next topic, which is now we're gonna start talking about our practice here at UAB with renal cell cancer in a case-based format, right? So case number one. So. The most common question that I get uh, from my referring physicians, and I'm sure this is what, what you get too, is can you ablate this, right? So I want to provide you guys just a little bit of a framework about how I think about these things. Um, the thing that I use most frequently is the renal nephrometry score, and I use it because it spells renal. So R is for radius, E is endophytic, exophytic, N is how close it is to the collecting system, A is whether it's anterior, posterior, and L is, is its location relative to polar lines. But, you know, I don't sit there and go, oh, you're an 8P, right? And so I'm not going to do this case, or you're a, a 4A, and so I'm going to do this case. I just really use it as a framework to say, is this lesion big? Is it exophytic, right, which makes it easier? Is it endophytic, which makes it harder? How close is it to the collecting system, right? And is it anterior, posterior? So those are the questions I really ask myself. So as we're going through some of these cases, especially the ablation cases, just kind of ask yourself as you go through. So I'm looking at this one, right? Relatively small, it's exophytic, it's not anywhere close to the collecting system, and it's posterior, right? So theoretically, this should be a pretty straightforward ablation. So we see this patient in clinic, and the biggest thing is when I see them in my clinic is I like to set, I like to set expectations, right? Right? So obviously we're going to talk about indications, contraindications, we're going to talk about complications, but I really go through, I said, listen, you're going to come in, this is what's going to happen. When you wake up, you're going to be sore, you know, you're going to be sore for two or three days. Uh, that's to be expected. You might see some blood in your urine, that blood in your urine might go away, it should go away after a couple of days. If it doesn't, give me a call. I had all of this stuff off at the pass, right? Because I've just learned through experience that when somebody has blood in their year and the day afterwards, they might freak out a little bit and they might give you a call and realize most of that time that goes away, okay? So when we bring the patient in, right? So now the patient's in prone position. What I like to do when I'm thinking about this, when I'm, when I'm putting my probes in, I like to think about coming across, the, uh, coming across the lesion like a scissor, right? And so that's what I did here. I came across one of my probes is cutting across it just like a scissor. And I had one of the reps tell me when I very first started, he said, you know, if you cut it off from its blood supply, that even if you miss a little, you know, edge of it, you know, it's going to die anyway, right? And so I've really seen that in my practice. And I, I do believe that now. So when I, when I'm doing this, I, like, I don't try to land my probe right in the dead center of the lesion. I'm actually trying to miss on the renal parenchymal side so I can create a big margin because I'm trying to devascularize that tumor. And so I really think about a scissor when I'm going across it, right? And so what do I do for my cryoablation? So what I do is I usually do a 10 minute freeze. Um, sometimes I know the, the companies will tell you you don't get any benefit by going longer. I actually do think you get a little bit benefit. So sometimes if I need a couple millimeters or two, mm -hmm. I will take it out to 12 minutes, but my timing is typically this. I start, this is a, a scan that I get at five minutes. You can see the ice ball is here. This is my scan at 10 minutes during my first freeze. Then I do an active thaw. And then this is my scan at five minutes during my second freeze. And you can see the ice ball is growing each time. That's what I like about it. And then here, this is my, this is my freeze at 10 minutes just before I turn off my machine. And I like this image here because it shows me the maximal size of my ice ball and gives me a good sense, right? So we know that that tumor is out here. We've really created a nice margin going right up to that renal sinus fat. So that patient's gonna have in, you know, a nice outcome there. Most of our patients now we're sending home the same day 
We see them back in our clinic in about two weeks, and that's just the post-procedure check. I used to see them in a week, and every so often I'd hear that they're still sore, so I just moved it out another week, and now nobody's sore, right? So my clinic's much easier, right? So I just moved it back a week, and uh, uh, that's made it much better. I get my first follow-up imaging at three months. I know some people talk about it doing it at six weeks. I think renal cell is a pretty indolent cancer, so I do it at three months and see if there's anything left for us to do. It is very uncommon to have to come back and do any touch-up, especially for T1A disease. So speaking of T1A disease, right? So less than four centimeters in size. This is a table from the JVAR QI guidelines that I wrote earlier this year. And you can see, so primary efficacy, which means that I ablate the tumor and there was no residual disease. We're great, right? Like we're almost 98% on the high end. And when you consider repeat ablations, right? We're essentially 99%, right? So if I bring somebody in and there's a little residual disease and I go back in and treat again, we're essentially 99% efficacious. Local recurrence, happens anywhere in two to 5% of patients. Cancer specific survival is super high, obviously, um, because they're small lesions and because RCC is relatively indolent. Overall survival, obviously not a good indicator for percutaneous ablation, just because we're getting older and sicker patients compared to partial nephrectomy. But multiple uh, large database series showing the outcomes for partial nephrectomy and ablation are essentially the same for T1A disease. I tell my patients this all the time and I really believe it. It is essentially the same, okay? Especially when you consider repeat ablations. What about problems, right? So the biggest thing for our problems is hemorrhage. And that's the biggest thing that I talk to people about is that bleeding can happen in anywhere right around three to 4% of patients. Um, but what you see in these uh, database and, and population-based studies is that we have less complications and less detriment to renal function than, uh, than, uh, than partial nephrectomy. And the other thing that I tell people is like, listen, 10% of partial nephrectomies get converted into radical nephrectomy. And then I had a patient who had a very central tumor and the, and the offer from urology was total nephrectomy. And I told her, I said, listen, we might not get it all right away, but like, their, their best case scenario is my worst case scenario, right? I, I use that proposition a lot. Like worst case for me, they lose their kidney. That's basically what they're getting offered. So a lot of patients are willing to kind of go through that because they don't want their whole kidney taken out. All right, so second case, right? So again, renal nephrometry wise, this is very small. It's exophytic. It is anterior, but it's not close. Uh, to the, uh, it's not close to the collecting system. So this is really a very typical uh, cancer where I would choose to use microwave ablation. So that's what you're seeing in the middle here. I came in from a posterior approach, again, missing on the renal parenchymal side, and I'll burn this thing off. We could did a little hydro dissection here. We'll talk about that in a minute. And this is immediately post, right? So you can see kind of like there's some hyperdensity there along there. That's the uh, coagulative necrosis that you see. That is a very common appearance, but you can see what I did. I came across and I put my probe along the renal parenchymal side of this lesion in order to get a nice margin across there, okay? So, you know, I stole the slide from Ron Ariano. He used this at the, at the I think at SIR a couple of years ago, but that actually turns out that he stole this from an arm wrestling website, which I didn't know existed, but they are out there, right? And so, you know, I think, you know, I'm lucky to be at a practice where we've got both heat-based and cold-based technology. And I think that um, I hear a lot of people that are like dedicated, like I always use cryo, I always my microwave. And I, I just, you know, I think they each have a role to play and I don't think that they're polar opposites. Um, and we'll kind of, I'll show you on the next slide why I choose what, uh, you know, for different patients. But, you know, really for me, it's, it's, it depends on the patient, you know, for these, you know, as we look through for these small exophytic lesions, right? It's hard to beat the rapidity of microwave ablation, right? I go in, I burn for four or five minutes and we're done, right? On the other end of the spectrum, larger lesions that are more central, that are more, that are, that are closer to critical structures. Like those are the ones where I, I go much more towards cryoablation. And so for me, it's kind of this spectrum, right? So endophytic small, lean towards microwave, central large, go towards cryoablation. And that's because I like with the larger lesions being able to see my ablation zone. I think that's really important. Um, and also when it's closer to critical structures, especially centrally, I think cryoablation is a much more gentle ablation overall. Um, it gives me the opportunity to, to watch it and see what's happening over time, to turn down the ablation probes, turn things off. Um, and I just think it is much more gentle as we're approaching on critical, critical structures. So third case, right? So the most common question that I get is, about these anterior lesions, right? So again, we're doing our renal nephrometry score. It's, it's less than three centimeters in size, so it's not very big. It's mostly exophytic, so that's good. It's not close to the collecting system. You can see a good distance between that and the renal sinus fat, but it is anterior. And you can see the problem with anterior lesions is that you have colon right there. Sometimes small bowel will be there. 
And so I, I will say when interventional radiologists send me cases to look at, I would say this is, and that's why I wanted to show this case. This is by far and away, you know, the most common thing that I get uh, as, apart from larger lesions is how do we address these anterior lesions? So I wanted to show you a couple cases of how I address these anterior lesions. So this is that case. And, you know, so I talked about that scissor approach before, and the reason I'm not doing that here is because if you think about what, what's the scissor approach, right? I would come in across here, and the problem I would have with creating like a scissor and cutting that off from its blood supply is then my ice ball is then growing out towards the colon. And I don't think that that's controllable, right? I mean, it is in a way, but I don't think it's controllable in a very reliable way that makes me very confident about doing that, right? So. What I'm doing here is I'm bringing, so that's really my second thing. If I can't create a scissor because there's some sort of critical structure nearby, I have this kind of concept of like pointing toward the danger. And why do I point toward the danger? You can see my probe here is coming and it's pointing towards the danger, which is small bowel and colon. And the reason I do that is with, with the probes that I use, I have five millimeters of lethal ice from the tip. And I find that to be very reliable and very controllable. And so I feel really comfortable that if my tip is there, I'm not going to go out past that. Okay. So that's what I'm doing here is I'm not coming across and cutting it off like a scissor. I'm pointing towards the danger because I don't want to damage the colon. Okay. That's bad. Let's not do that. So the other thing that you can do here is what I'm showing you is how I do the hydro dissection, right? So then I'm coming in here and I'm putting in a 22 gauge needle. I'm putting in some fluid here and you can see I'm creating a very nice safe ablation zone between the uh, ablation zone and the colon. Here's me at my maximal ice ball. After I've removed my probe, you can see we've covered the lesion. Here's the ice ball. There's my hydro dissection fluid and there's the colon, very safe and very away, right? So the very first time I did hydro dissection, I hydro dissected and then put in the probes. Mistake, I do not like doing it that way anymore, right? So my, one of my partners, Niall Saad came in, he's like, why are you doing it like that, right? If you know Niall, that makes a lot of sense to you. Why are you doing it like that? Because the kidney was moving all over the place, right? And so his suggestion, and that's what I do now is I get my probes in place, all the ones that I want, right? Uh, then I do a, a stick freeze on one of the probes to hold the kidney in place. And then I put my 22 gauge needle in and you can put that 22 gauge needle through liver, through kidney, through colon, anything you need to do to get it where it needs to go. Right. And once you're there, I usually put in about 20 to 40 cc's of saline just to make sure it's in the right, it's going to the right spot that I want it to do. And then once I do that, I just start pumping the fluid in. Right. And I hear that a lot, like how much is enough? Well, you know, it's not going to hurt them. 200, 300 cc's of saline in their abdomen isn't going to hurt them. So I tend to put in more because what's the harm in creating an additional safety zone there? So it's usually somewhere between two, 300 cc's of saline. But when I'm, you know, I'm checking that too. You got to watch to see that the fluid doesn't dissipate away. If it does, you go back in, you put some more in before you do another freeze. And here's that patient, you know, on their follow-up scan, you know, no evidence of residual disease there. All right, so another anterior lesion. It's hard to believe that this is anterior, but this is, we do a lot of contrast enhanced ultrasound. And so what you're seeing here is actually a, a complex cyst that has enhancing septa, right? So you can see the cyst here a little bit and, and the septa here. We do a lot of contrast enhanced ultrasound. So I wanted to show this image, even though it doesn't give you a good relation um, of where it is being anterior, but it is really nice for our patients that have renal dysfunction. We have a really good program here for that. So with the help of my diagnostic radiology college, you can see there's a hyperdense cyst, there's another cyst, like we determined that this was the cyst, right? So we kind of related it here. And, and again, anterior lesion. So another way you can treat this is by putting the patient supine. And then I brought my microwave ablation, uh, ablation probe in from the side, again, pointing towards the danger, which is the bowel, but also I'm cutting it off from the rest. So I'm, I'm kind of accomplishing two things. I'm cutting it off like a scissor and I'm, I'm pointing uh, towards that danger. Now, I still didn't feel comfortable, right? Because it's within two centimeters of my ablations at my needle. I don't like that. And so what I did is I just put a little 22 gauge needle here that you can't see on this image. And I did a little uh, hydro dissect or a little, uh, yeah, a little hydro dissection there. You can clearly see it moved the, the bowel away. Very safe ablation, patient did great. Um, and I think they just had their first follow up this week, which is why I don't have their image, but they're doing really well. Okay, so case five, right? So we saw this case earlier, but like, this is not the first case that you should be doing in your practice, right? Like if this is the first case that they send you, like, please run away from this. Like this, you know, so, but what we're going to do is we're going to put together everything we've learned so far, right? So we're not going to say no, right? We're going to try to fig figure out a way to, you know, figure this out for the patient. 
and we're going to just talk to them in our clinic and we're going to figure out a way or talk to them about the risks and, 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 and all the inherent complications that there are. The problem with this lesion is not only is it encroaching on four centimeters in size, right? It's completely endophytic, which is also a problem, but it's basically sitting in the collecting system, right? But this guy has terrible heart failure. He's got uh, uh, CAD, he's got heart failure. He's got, you know, uh, he's on anticoagulation for a history of DVT or PE, I can't remember which. This guy is never ever going to the operating room, right? So this is not someone that I'm gonna take just because they sent it to me. This is a guy who isn't gonna get a curative option unless we do something in interventional radiology, right? So th that's, the, that's my mindset going into him. That's how I talk to him about this case when we're talking about it is that, listen, central tumors, when you look at all the nephrometry scoring out there, the thing that probably plays out the most as far as complications and recurrence is size and central tumors, right? So this is set up for uh, problems, but you know, we're going to, how do we approach this in a safe way? Right? So again, I'm going to come in from the side. And the reason I'm coming in from the side is because I can't do my scissor technique, right? Because that's basically cutting off the whole kidney. It's freezing into his ureter, which I don't want to hit. Right? So I'm coming in pointing towards the danger, which is the ureter, which is the renal pelvis. And I'm trying to stop my probes basically right at the tip of the lesion. Uh, so that I get that five millimeters of freeze and basically get all of it out here, right? And this is what I tell the guy. I said, listen, if we leave a little bit behind, we'll watch it. Maybe we come back with IRE or something like that. But, you know, I'm going to get most of it this way. So I used four probes. I'm using the measurement here because I'm just trying to show you, I like to keep my probes anywhere between 1.5 and 1.8 centimeters apart. They'll tell you two centimeters. I do not think the ice ball grows together well when they're two centimeters apart. So I usually, it's usually about 1.5, 1.8. So this is the top set of probes. This is the bottom set of probes. And the, but then we think that we're safe. Well, we're not really safe, right? Because now I'm starting to look and say, well, wait a minute, what about this colon here, right? So this colon is now within two centimeters of my probe. I'm supposed to get 1.8 centimeters of lethal ice in this from the from that probe. So I don't feel overly comfortable with it being there. So what do I do? I put a little 22 gauge needle there and I put a little gas in and I did some pneumo dissection. You can see what that did is that increased my margin from 1.8 centimeters to 3.9 centimeters. So I felt much safer about ablating. The guy did great. He got, I think he stayed one night in the hospital just because of his medical comorbidities, but he went home the next day and he's got no residual disease on his first contrast enhanced ultrasound. He's had multiple more. I'm not showing it because honestly, it is very difficult to see. And you just look at a blob and you just have to take my, my word for it anyway. Okay, so larger tumors, right? So now we're looking again, back to our nephrometry score. Now it's greater than four centimeters. So now we're talking about T1B tumors, right? So by definition, these probably should go to surgery. But, uh, you know, this patient, again, isn't going to go to the OR because she's got, uh, she has a history of renal transplant. This is her native kidney, but she has a, a, a right lower quadrant transplant kidney and multiple medical comorbidities, right? So we've got a big tumor, little kidney. Those are the ones that always worry me the most about bleeding, um, just because you have these big lesions hanging off, essentially no renal parenchyma, right? So how do we go about treating these larger tumors? So for me, what I like to do is I like to be sequential when I'm doing this. And what I mean by that is I like to stop at the top of the lesion or at the bottom of the lesion and work my way up or work my way down, okay? And again, I like to be about 1.5 or 1.8 centimeters apart when I'm doing it. And what's the right number of lesions I don't, or what number of probes? I don't know, right? I think a good place to start is about the centimeter in size plus one. So for this one, maybe five probes. We ended up using four, um, but you know, again, Keep your probes about 1.5, 1.8 centimeter apart and just go and build your ice ball so that you cover the whole lesion with at least five millimeters of margin. That's the best advice I can give you. You can see what we did is we did some hydrodissection to keep it away from colon. We did some hydrodissection to keep it away from the genital femoral nerve. Here's my ice ball and she did great. Now she's two years now post this now and she's got no evidence of recurrence disease or residual disease. So from that same paper, let's talk about T1B tumors just for a minute. Um, you know, obviously we do a little worse, right? Like our primary efficacy is lower. Our secondary, secondary efficacy is better, but right. But that means repeat procedures. I mean, local recurrence is all over the map, right? Anywhere from three to 40%. So this is the problem, right? Like how do we improve our local recurrence rates for T1B tumors so that we can convince the, the oncology, the oncology community at large 
<clears throat> that we are a reasonable option for some of these patients, right? And so that was the big reason from a standards division standpoint that we decided to include T1B tumors in this paper is because we want to start pushing out there the idea, because I hear this every so often, that it's quote unquote contraindicated. Well, it's not contraindicated, right? It just doesn't do as well, right? And so now you're looking down here at the complications. We couldn't grade out the complications like we could for T1A disease because there's just less papers out there. But overall, you can see instead of about a 5% major complication rate, you're seeing somewhere between six and 16% with a weighted mean of about 12%. So overall, the complications are higher. They're not unacceptable, especially when you consider these patients aren't going to the OR, right? We're not saying, hey, let's take a normal healthy patient. We're saying in patients who have no other option, I think this is overall a safe and relatively efficacious option for T1B tumors. All right, and so our last ablation case. The reason I wanna show this is because this case almost didn't get referred to me, right? Because the urologist thought that this was too high, right? It's kind of like Major League the movie, like it's too high. What does too high mean, right? And so too high because he was worried that lung was going to get in the way. And so how do you approach these lesions that are high? And the reason I wanted to show you this is because, you know, so what we did here is we just did a, this was we did a transhepatic approach and we ablated the lesion with cryoablation. The reason I wanted to show you this is because I don't want you guys to be afraid of doing a transhepatic approach. Don't choose to do it if you don't have to. But the two things I think it comes in handy is number one, when lung gets in the way, which it was here. Now, maybe Steven would be like really happy to like go through the lawn or maybe drop the lawn and do an artificial pneumothorax. But for me, the liver is a much more robust organ to go through than the lawn. And the, 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 the issue of seeding, like you're still going through tissues anyway. So I don't know that the issue of seeding is any higher for the liver than it is for any other organ or tissue that we're going through, right? So that's one thing. The second thing that we run into a lot in Alabama is like, not a lot, but a few times is body habitus, right? Like I love to put somebody prone, but I had a patient who, you know, frankly, she just had too much junk in the trunk to get prone through the CT scanner, right? And so we had to flip her back onto her stomach and we had to go through her liver to treat it. She did great, but these are the things that you have to do. And what I wouldn't want you to do is send a patient away, say, I can't do it because we can't go through the liver, right? It's an option. You can do it. It's not your first choice, but it is a choice that you can do, okay? All right. So those are our image ablation cases. Now I want to just spend the last, you know, maybe 10 minutes or so talking about uh, image guided embolization for renal cell cancer. So why are we talking about uh, embolization, right? So we're talking about it because the main histologic variant of RCC is clear cell RCC and clear cell RCC is a hypervascular tumor, just like HCC, right? And so the logic <clears throat> comes that there are these case series out there that use embolization because it's a hypervascular tumor and because the kidney is a hypervascular or a vascular organ, there's these multiple case series out there that use embolization to decrease bleeding from ablation, to locate the tumor, right? If it's a central tumor, do we embolize it with a lapidol or lumi beads or something like that? Or do we improve our ablation? Do we get a better technical success? We don't know the answer to that, right? And so one thing that we know, right? Like this is the ablate algorithm from the, from the group at Mayo. They suggest embolizing all tumors prior to ablation greater than five centimeters in size. Why? Because they did a retrospective case match series where they took five patients that got embolized compared to five patients that didn't get embolized and they found less bleeding, right? Not great evidence, but it's some evidence, I suppose, right? So we don't know the role, but that's at least the logic, right? So <clears throat> where can we use it? This is a patient who you can see, you know, large right renal mass, vascular invasion here on coronal. Again, you can see it invading up into the IVC. So this is a patient that presents with pain and hematuria. Pain hematuria is actually not a common presenting symptom. Less than a third of patients now with RCC present with pain and hematuria. Most of them are found incidentally. So in these patients that come up, right, like symptomatically, can we embolize these kidneys? And I think it's, pro what I tell my urologists all the time is I think it's probably underutilized and, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So what do we do? We bring this patient in, we do an angiogram. This is the right uh, superior renal artery. She actually had accessory renal arteries, which you have to check for those things. About 20 to 25% of the population will have accessory renal arteries, but you can see predominantly from the lower right renal artery, you can see this hypervascular mass, right? So we get our microcatheter out there and we embolized <clears throat> with a combination of a thiodol, you know, and alcohol. And the patients decrease the hematuria, decrease pain over time. Do I know that? I think I know that because we did a systematic, re a systematic review review and meta-analysis, uh, which is out under review now, we looked at over 1,300 studies. Uh, only nine studies met inclusion of 237 patients, one prospective, the rest of them retrospective studies. But what we found is that pain improved in 98% of the patients. 
and hematuria improved in 95% of the patients. So I think it's a relatively low risk procedure that we can do for these patients with advanced disease, even if they're not coming to definitive therapies. All right, what about this case, right? So here's a guy on dialysis, multiple medical comorbidities. Again, another six and a half centimeter tumor that they're asking me to ablate. So what do I do here, right? So again, I bring the patient in, I do an angiogram from the left renal artery. You can see this hypervascular mass here. I get out as close to it as I can. I embolized it with particles because I was gonna go ablate it the next day. Why was I doing this? I was really doing it to decrease the bleeding, right? So I'm not necessarily worried about tumor kill. I'm not bringing them in three or four weeks later to see if I reduce the size, although I think that is a good argument. We just don't know the answer to that, but I'm really doing this in these larger lesions to decrease bleeding. So I try to do it pretty close temporally to when I'm doing the embolization. So here, I'm doing the embolization and I'm either doing the same day or next day doing the ablation. And you can see, if you remember my photo from beginning, look how much I learned from two years ago about organizing my probes. The last one was a huge mess. Nothing was organized. Here I was able to line up my probes nicely. So we put seven probes in for that six and a half centimeter lesion. And you can see here's my ice ball, plenty far away from colon. Guy did great, has no residual disease. Again, taking someone with cancer to no cancer who doesn't have a good surgical option. So what's the role of embolization? Again, you know, we don't really know, right? So in our institution, we did a pr uh, propensity score matching analysis. We compared nine patients with 18 pa nine patients who went um, uh, embolization and cryoablation compared to 18 patients who were matched by age, sex, and tumor diameter, right? Compared and compared them who got cryoablation only. And what we looked at was change in hematocrit, change in GFR, number of cryoprobes pro used, number of complications, and frankly, Frankly, there was no difference. Like we really couldn't find like an objective benefit, you know, uh, to embolizing these lesions. But, you know, I think there's a lot, again, retrospective, small cohort. I think there's a lot of work to be done, but I think the question is still out there about whether this is a good idea or not. So where are we with embolization with ablation for RCC? I think we really need prospective data to demonstrate its efficacy. I, again, I think all the case series that are out there are saying it's safe and it's, technically feasible. Well, great. I know that, but does it work? And I don't think that we know that yet. Um, I think we need to explore our target outcomes and our populations, right? Is it three centimeters, right? So urology thinks that complications go up at three centimeters based on old data, right? So is it three centimeters you're embolizing? Is it T1B at four centimeters? Is it the Mayo model and, and five centimeters? So who is it, right? And are we doing it to reduce bleeding? So we should do it the day afterwards. Are we doing it to increase our tumor kill, right? So should we use more penetrating embolic agents? Or are we doing it to reduce the tumor size so we can cover it easier, right? So should I embolize it and then wait to ablate it four to six weeks later, right? Like we just don't know any of these things and people are doing this out in practice uh, kind of ad hoc right now, right? And so what are our techniques and what are embolics? So a lot for us that we don't know, right? And so the last case, going to show you guys is, you know, for prior to surgery, right? So here's a patient with a, a six, a six, a little over a six centimeter tumor. Um, and they are either going to go to partial nephrectomy or nephrectomy. Actually went to nephrectomy. Now I'm thinking about their follow-up images. And so we get asked to embolize it before they go to the OR as a way to decrease bleeding, right? So we bring the patient in, you can see, and this is right here. We don't really see a lot. I see this like more than you think, where you don't necessarily see the tumor from the main renal artery angiogram. So you do kind of have to get this selective. I'm out here with a microcatheter. I'm like, I'm pretty sure where I am, but you can see I wasn't even 100% sure where I was. So I ended up doing a comb beam to make sure that I was actually targeting the area that I wanted to target, right? So we ended up, you can see down here, we followed her up, you know, uh, several weeks later, and then she ended up going to the OR, getting nephrectomy, and then she did really well. So we really did this to decrease the amount of blood loss that she had. And so is there evidence behind this? Well, this is a study from 2000. Uh, you know, this was retrospective study, but it was a case, it was a, it was a propensity score match, right? And so they had 118 patients that underwent embolization prior to nephrectomy. They matched them with 116 patients based on sex, age, stage, tumor size, tumor grade, lymph node status, things like that. And what they found is that embolized patients had a longer overall survival, even on subgroups analysis, right? So based on stage, size, whether or not they had lymph nodes positive or not. So, you know, there's at least some evidence out there. And again, I'm not saying for every patient, every time, what I'm trying to give you is uh, an armamentarium to talk to your urologist that like, listen, this is a low risk procedure, right? That at least there's some evidence that we can help with symptoms. There's evidence we can help with overall survival. There's evidence that we can help with bleeding, right? So to me, it's like, a, it's a really a win-win, you know, for them as we go through. 
All right, so uh, those are the cases that I wanted to show you guys. And I think we're running up on a good time to answer questions. So in summary, um, percutaneous ablation, it's, it's an accepted approach by the NCCN, ASCO, AUA for appropriately selected patients with renal cell carcinoma, right? So who is that appropriate, appropriately selected patients? I would say more and more for patients with T1A disease, like if it was my mother, family, whatever, I really think ablation is the way to go. Because we have less detriment to renal function, we have fewer complications, patients get out of the hospital faster. I, I just think that as we go to more cost-effective analyses, we're, we're going to see that more and more. Now, with T1B disease, we really should be focusing on these really poor operative candidates until we can get our outcomes more in line with what they are for T1A disease. And renal artery embolization can be used in combination with ablation or surgery or as a standalone therapy to reduce symptoms, okay? And I really do think it's underutilized, and I think it's something we should be talking to our urologists a lot more about. All right, so thanks for your guys' attention. There's my email, there's my Twitter handle. You are certainly free to reach out to me uh, any way that you'd like. And with that, I am happy to take any questions that anybody has. All right, AJ, we have a, we have a lot of questions here, so we'll try to get some. Uh, uh, the first question is active versus passive thaw between freeze cycles. Is there, I guess, the question is really about published evidence, whether there's any data to show that the active thaw um, provide some benefit over passive thaw? Yeah, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, I used to always do a passive thaw just because that's what I was taught when I was, was training. Um, the funny thing is, at least with our system, the active thaw is really like only three minutes shorter than the passive thaw. Like it really, it doesn't really feel like it does that much. Um, but I do use an active thaw now, but I'm not aware of any data that says one's better than the other. It does speed it up just a little bit. Yeah, I know that um, in the lung, I tend to use um, you know, passive thaw just because I found that active thaw resulted in more pneumothoraces, but I think in soft tissue structures, I generally, I tend to use um, more active thaw. We'll have to see if, uh, if Dr. Stavropoulos can give us his, his opinion on that. Um, this next question relates to, it, it sounds like it's specific to uh, microwave ablation type, but they're asking about LK probes versus PR probes. Um, you know, I don't use the new wave system, so, yeah, so it's, uh, not it's really... hard for me to answer. Uh, we, you know, right now, uh, well, I don't want to get into it because I just, you know, like I, I just don't use the new wave system, so it'd be hard for me to say, um, you know, one way but or the other. When you're choosing, I guess really with the question though is more a matter of, the, so we, we do use new wave. LK is a much larger ablation zone than the PR. Um, do you tend to choose a probe that has a larger ablation zone over, for example, putting two probes with a smaller zone, or is it more about sculpting? kind of your thoughts on that? Uh, it usually, um, it's about getting the larger ablation zone. You know, um, I am of the opinion that if you can do it safely, I'd rather take, I and mean, you could probably see from one of those early cases, I'd rather take a little more kidney um, because it's so rare for us to move somebody from normal kidney function to abnormal kidney function or to move them from one stage of chronic kidney disease to another. So um, I'm almost always using, so I, I mean, I use just, I mean, for full disclosure, I use the BTG system um, and, I, I, and, and I use angiodynamics for microwave because that's what we have. And I'm almost always doing six minutes times 140 watts, right? Because I always take everything that I can as long as that I can do it safely because I want to create that margin. And my thought process behind that is, is twofold. One, you know, I had a partner, he's retired now, but he set up the ablation practice here. And, you know, if you look back at his cases, people are coming in three and four times, right? Because it was like one probe here, another probe, and he's like getting it. And yeah, I guess his complications, I mean, they weren't really lower than mine, but I think people take time off from work. It's expensive, you know, and I just think if I can do it all in one fell swoop, that's what I want to do. So that's one thing. And I think too, there's at least you know, some preclinical data to suggest, I explained to patients like kind of like a, like a, like a hornet's nest, right? So if I'm going to poke the tumor and piss it off, I want to kill it, right? Because I don't want to poke it and then piss it off and then leave some of it there because I actually think that makes it grow a little faster. And I don't know that that affects outcomes in RCC. I don't think we know that yet, but I want to get it off. I'm going to go do it. So um, I, I would tend to overblate. If that's your question, I would tend to overblate rather than underblate, as long as I can do it safely. The next question is asking about tract cautery function. Uh, I guess in, in the setting of microwave, um, you know, do you use do you use tract cautery function when you're pulling your probes out? Yeah, I use the cautery function both on my microwave system and on the cryo system. Um, there was a study on the with the BTG cryo system to show that it didn't really make any difference, but I still do it. Uh, I just kind of out of habit at this point, but I definitely do do the tract ablation on the way out um, for my microwave system. Okay. 
pneumo versus hydrodissection. I know that in my practice, I started originally with hydrodissection and, and in these soft tissue things have, have now moved a lot towards just air-based pneumodissection, but I don't know if you, your experience yeah, in air versus no. CO2. So, so let me, right. So uh, I almost showed this case, but then I was like, well, someone's going to, someone's going to think I'm a terrible person if I show it. So, you know, um, so I, short answer is if it's in a, if it's in a gravity dependent position, right? Like if, it, if I want the fluid to sit, if I want it to sit, then I'll put fluid in, right? Because it sits really nicely. If it's in a gravity, let me see if I can, you know, if it's a, if a gravity independent or antidependent position, um, then I will tend to use pneumodissection there. Like here, remember this case, right? So this is a gravity antidependent location. So that's why I use pneumodissection there because the air is gonna stay there longer than the fluid's gonna stay there, right? So this particular case, right? I used air because I've never had a problem with air. You know, and I know like in the OR and stuff, they use CO2 because it dissipates really quickly, but I must have punctured a vein in the, in the renal capsule or whatever, because when we put air in there, eventually air traced up the IVC, traced up into the right hepatic vein, and it terrified me. I thought I was going to kill the guy, right? But, you know, what I, and you can see, we wrote it up, it's in seminars in earlier this year or last year in 2019. So, I didn't want to move the patient, right? Because I thought the air was going to go somewhere else and it was going to get like, you know, trapped in his, in his pulmonary artery. And so what I ended up, I put an 18 gauge needle into the IVC and I just aspirated all the air out, right? So I have used air less ever since that experience, right? But generally, um, I would say that if it's in a dependent location, I use hydrodissection. If it's an antidependent location, I use pneumodissection. Um, I don't often put contrast in there. If you do put contrast, that's fine. I do it if I feel like with the streak and the structures that are there, I'm gonna have a hard time seeing the fluid, um, especially if it's like small bowel, sometimes it'd be hard to see on CT. If you put contrast in there, it's really dilute. It's like two cc's into 50 cc's of, of saline, right? Because if you put too much in there, it's gonna be too much uh, for you to see and you're gonna really hate yourself if you put like more in there. So, so that's, my, that's my, my, my algorithm for hydro versus pneumodissection. A couple of questions about ureteral stenting, both for infusion of warm saline in the setting of cryo or infusion of cold saline in the setting of microwave. Uh, how often are you doing that? Is that, a, is that something you reserve for, um, you know, very special cases on endophytic tumors or what's your, what's your kind yeah, of Yeah, you know, my, um, I would do it more um, and I think it's a good idea. Uh, I don't do it as much because I have not found a lot of support from that from my urologists. You know, I just, the, the for, and, you know, we've got a better relation. I mean, we've always had a good relationship, but I've been here for longer now. So I'm sure I could readdress it with them at some point because I don't, I really do think them coming down to put up a stent. And then I don't know that it needs to be warm or cold. I mean, I think I've talked to a lot of people, just room temperature, no matter what it is, is probably okay. I think it's a good idea. What they talk about in the Mayo paper is that if it's within a centimeter uh, of the renal pelvis, that you should think about doing that. And, and I don't do that because you know, I've had to go without doing it because my urologists are not happy about having to come down and, and, and put in a ureteral stent. Um, and so a lot of times what I do is I kind of do the pointing toward the danger thing and then freeze up to it as much as I can. And then if I have something residual, I'll come back and clean up with IRE. That's been more my practice rather than ureteral stent. But, you know, people do it and they have good success with it. And I think if urologists are willing to do it, put in a stent, I would say 100% go for it. That's just not been my experience here. And it does seem that you're, you're, for the most part with endophytic tumors, choosing cryo over microwave in part yeah. because of, because yeah, of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I heard, uh, I was at an event, I think Matt Kallstrom was there and Christos Georgiades from Hopkins. And I can't remember who said it, but their thought was, or at least they, I don't know if it was a paper or they, in their experience that they had said that they think with microwave that theoretically when it's close, that that urine can even boil and that hot yeah. urine could even ca potentially cause strictures, even though you're not hitting it. And I don't, I've never seen that. Right. But to me, what I said is like, I just feel like if I'm going to get close to a critical structure, I want something that's going to grow slowly that I can turn off, right? With microwave, I burn for four or five minutes and we're done. And I just feel like that's so rapid. I just feel like it, I, when I'm closer to soft tissue structures, like the body wall, I feel like patients have a little more pain afterwards with microwave compared to cryo. So yeah, my, my default when it's a critical structure, central tumor is to go to cryo rather than microwave. I'm probably about 75, 25 in my practice, I would say. 
Okay, pre ablation biopsies, or I would even just broaden the question to, you know, when when do you choose to biopsy? Um, you know, I think that it's it, there's such a disconnect between what happens in private practice versus academic places, and even amongst the academic places. So I think it's a it's interesting to hear your perspective. Yeah, and you know, we talked about this at the session at the SIO, and it was the discussion that it that it generated was crazy. I was like, why do people want to talk about biopsies so much, right? Um, so in residency, we biopsied at a separate session. Um, and so that was kind of what I was always used to. And then in fellowship, we biopsied during the same session. And then uh, early on in my practice, some of my partners were like, we don't biopsy at all, right? So I've seen the full spectrum, I feel like. Of. Um, I biopsy at the same session because it's what my, number one, it's what my urologists want us to do. Like just you know, they think it's the right thing to do for research and all these other kinds of things and to measure outcomes. So we do biopsy at the same session. Um, there was a paper, I think Damien Dupuy, Dupuy uh, wrote it in 2019, I think September last year, where basically showed that biopsy prior to the ablation changed the approach in less than 2% of patients or right around in 2% of patients. So I don't think that doing it beforehand really alters what you're going to do, especially for once it moves past two centimeters in size or three centimeters, especially three centimeters in size, the likelihood of it being benign is extraordinarily low, like less than 5%, I would say, right? Whereas if it's less than two centimeters in size, the likelihood of it being benign is like 20%, right? So, I mean, it, it depends on the patient a little bit. That's one thing. Um, I will, so there's two situate, there's really one situation now where I biopsy beforehand, and that's if I don't want to do the case. And because I had a patient who, for all the world, looked like RCC. They called it as RCC. We went in. I did the biopsy. We did the ablation. It actually turned out to be pyelonephritis, like a mass-like pyelonephritis. And he, and he did okay, got bacteremic, all these other kinds of things. But he was sick for a little bit, right? And so the biopsy came back as inflammation slash infection, followed him up, biopsied it again, infection, inflammation. And so eventually he ended up going because they kept thinking it was cancer. And, and me and the urologist were like, it's not cancer, but he was concerned about it. They ended up taking out the kidney and it was all inflammation. He never had any cancer there. So that's the thing that gives me pause now. So like, if I get a weird read, like can't rule out XGP, or if it's a really difficult tumor, I might say to the patient, let's just biopsy it, right? Because let's say there's a 10% chance we don't have to do this case. Well, that's great. That's worth it to me, right? Um, at this point. So if it's a really difficult tumor or it's a weird read, or it just doesn't smell to me now, like an RCC straight away, I will do the biopsy beforehand, but the vast majority of my patients, I'm doing the biopsy on the day of. Um, there's a specific question here, and, and this is beyond my, uh, my knowledge base, but um, they're talking about clamp versus non-clamp nephron sparing partial nephrectomy with urology for T1B lesions. Um, I mean, do you get involved uh, in that level of discussion with your urologist in terms of their uh, sort of technique? That's really interesting because I actually just got sent something to review of putting up a balloon, not clamping, but putting up a balloon, right? To, to, and so it's, it's like five cases and it wasn't us, but um, so it's just interesting that that came up. Um, we are not, you know, obviously here's the thing, right? So balloon potentially makes sense. Like, like this, this, this institution was doing um, clamp to me doesn't make a lot of sense because the reason they're sending them to me is because they don't want to take them to the OR, right? So if they're doing a clamp, right? Like they're already yeah. in the OR and they're asleep. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, in that sense, like I'm going to lose that patient. If I say, Hey, listen, like, I'm going to, I want you to clamp the, the artery in the OR. Like I'm going to lose that patient, you know? So mm -hmm. to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do it that way. Although I haven't read through the, through the case series, but, you know, putting up a balloon in there, like sometimes we do for postpartum hemorrhage, potentially, you know, Although what I would say is why not just embolize it, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're doing essentially the same thing and then you're having some sort of at least permanent effect rather than taking down the balloon and potentially having a de delayed bleed once, once it fully thaws, you know, just so I, I, that would be my, that would be my gestalt. And then in general for, for the complete nephrectomy patients, I, I know that we have a pretty active practice with our urologist for doing those pre-op embos. Do you do the same? Um, and also lot. do you, or, and, and do you do alcohol versus embolics? Just what's your practice there? Yeah, so um, not as much as I would like um, because a couple of our uroncs just don't think that it helps. Now, I have a couple of uroncs that do think that it helps, right? So we do some for them, um, but you know, uh, not you know, not a ton. Um, but I do, like I said, I do think it's something that we're working on building. Um, 
you know, so, and I think part of it is because from their standpoint, it's always like, well, I can't get them into IR and, you know, now it's going to be a week before IR can do it, all this other kind of stuff. So when we work together better, say, hey, I can do it the day before you take them to the OR, they're much more into it, you know, uh, than when it, than when there's some sort of delay. So if they're going to go to the OR, I tend to use, I mean, I tend to use alcohol more than particles when I'm going for kill, just because it penetrates a little bit deeper. Uh, do I have data to support that? No, I just know a lot of people do it that way. There's a lot of people who have hesitancy using alcohol for a lot of reasons. So do I think particles are perfectly acceptable? Absolutely. You know, um, I would probably use smaller particles um, just because you're trying to penetrate a little deeper and decrease the bleeding. But really at the end of the day, if it's before the OR, you're not you know, you're not like causing like necessarily cellular kill. You're just trying to decrease the bleeding, right? So you don't have to be perfect. So, uh, but my, my tendency is to use alcohol rather than particles in those situations. Although, you know, it's not, yeah. it's not hundred percent of the time, every time. And I, and I know that from our, from our urologist, the feedback that we've received is that it's a, it's a very different experience for them to get a patient after alcohol um, em embolization versus particle, just in terms of they can actually, it almost creates like a, I mean, you can thinking about it, you're pickling it. Um, and so they have this, it's kind of a, a pickled egg versus a regular egg. When they run their fingers along it, they can, they can much more easily kind of pull the kidney out. Um, so they much prefer the alcohol embolization over embolics. And they also just say it bleeds a lot less with the alcohol. So that's, that's direct feedback from our urologist. So we've stuck with that. Um, and in fact, we've had some cases where some of our docs have used embolics and then they've said, hey, you must have used embolics because this thing was still yeah. bloody when we took it out. So I think that that's, you know, obviously that's, uh, I'm providing you with anecdotal evidence, not a paper demonstrating that. Um, but I think it'd be an interesting thing if people, if people have a practice where some of their docs are using alcohol and some are using embolics to go back and look at things like blood loss and the, and the post-operative or the, or the operative reports for folks who have had those different types, because that's the feedback that we've, we've got. All right. Well, we can't uh, we can't keep you all night, AJ. But um, we got up over over uh, sixty attendees tonight, so that's great. Um, and thank you again so much for um, for participating in our in our uh, pairs webinar series this year. Um, uh, thank you all the trainees who who submitted to be part of the board. I think we're going to be having the first meeting. Um, Alice will reach out to you, and we'll be having that first meeting this week on um, getting you guys more involved and in helping to coordinate run all of these so people don't have to be looking at my ugly mug when we're running these sessions but um but yeah uh just uh, a great session great presentation excellent cases um and even saw i, I saw some uh, some big names on here peter horner and various folks who who chimed in and so just uh thank you everybody who participated in the meeting um hey, and I thanks aj no, i appreciate you guys having me on i'm going to plug one thing uh <laughs> if i can before i go you know, we are having our second national SIR Angio Club on December 16th. And so the submission site uh, online is open. And so please, if you have cool cases, um, please submit them because we're looking for trainees, early career, late career, all sorts of people from around the country. So please consider submitting cases there as well. It, it was a really great event. So we'd be happy to have somebody from Philadelphia represent there. So. And is that where where would they find the the links for that through um, SAR can, RFS yeah, on Twitter? So the or? SAR, yeah, the SAR account posted it yesterday. You can go like we'll be posting it from my account and from the SAR ECS account kind of going forward. There's a there's a website actually the SAR has, and that's where you can go on to register. And there's another link that you can go on submit cases. Great. And we'll, so we'll just try like, to I'll, we'll try to do it from pairs as well. We'll try to retweet that out then. Yeah, uh, fantastic. Yeah. That would we really important. appreciate that. It was a really great yeah. event. Happy and for everybody else out there, please uh, get folks to, 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 to join our webinars, get folks to join pairs, um, and, uh, and we're going to have a great year. Uh, anything else, AJ? No, awesome. Thank you guys so much. for This, this was great. Really, really happy to, to see everybody virtually. All right. Thanks so much. Take care. Okay. Have a good night.